it is my great pleasure to introduce Philip Wilkie. Philip, thank you so much for accepting the invitation. It is wonderful to have you here. And uh, before we start with the talk, let me give you a brief introduction about Philip. So Philip got his PhD at the University of Göttingen in Germany in 2017. Afterwards, he was working as a postdoctoral researcher at IBM Almaden in California for one year. And afterwards, he moved uh, for two years to the Center for Quantum Nanoscience in South Korea. And then in 2020, he started as YIG uh, Prepo Fellow at the KIT. And in 2020, he got the prestigious Emmy Nether Junior Research Group Leader Fellowship, which is uh, essentially the position that he holds now. Philip has been working on one of the most thrilling fields in STM in the last few years, which is combining scanning talent microscopy with electron spin resonance to resolve and control quantum systems at the microscopic scale with atomic resolution. And maybe one of the most remarkable findings with this technique has been the detection and control of nuclear spins in single atoms, and also the smallest realization of magnetic resonance in single atoms. And for, for the future, this technique has been uh, demonstrated to be extremely promising with regards to potential realizations of solid state architectures for quantum information processing. Electron spin resonance was invented less than eight years ago. And perhaps the most important uh, finding of this technique is that it has uh, energy resolution that it's way, way more precise than conventional STM techniques. And in particular, it is not limited by temperature and has been shown to give rise to an energy resolution of 10 nanoelectron volts at the atomic scale, making it one of the most precise techniques, both in energy and uh, spatial resolution simultaneously. And this technique in particular was shown by Philip to allow for quantum sensing of single atoms, in particular to allow probing the magnetic interaction between an individual atom and their environment, and in particular an individual atom and the tip, allowing to map in three dimensions, the magnetic interaction between these two systems. It was also shown by Philip that this technique can be used uh, to probe nuclear spins by exploiting the hyperfine coupling between individual atoms and the nuclear spin, and finally, even to do coherent spin manipulation using pulsed ESR. And today, Philip will tell us about some of these breakthroughs in ESR STM. And the title of his talk is Single Spin of Resonance of Individual Atoms and Molecules on a Surface. So with this, Philip, thank you so much for accepting the invitation. The floor is yours, and we look forward to your talk. Thank you, Jose, for the very, very kind introduction. And of course, it's a great pleasure uh, to, to, to come to this uh, seminar, uh, this colloquium, finally. So of course, I accept happily. Also, thank you very much for the introduction, uh, the topic introduction. So this is actually what I'm going to talk about. So basically, the highlights that he already, uh, uh, that Jose already mentioned. Uh, so Andreas and both uh, Andreas and Kai already gave a talk on swing spin resonance. So I try to navigate it a little bit. Uh, uh, through the whole story without uh, overlapping too much with them, but still getting a little bit uh, of the in uh, uh, to make it uh, understandable for everyone. Um, so with that, let's let's jump in. So the the key idea of um, of uh, our our research is at the at the intersect of uh, two major developments in information technology that happened over the last decades. First of all, this is completely obvious. Uh, there's Moore's law, the continuous miniaturization in devices and device fabrication that has now reached the nanometer scale and where things get more and more complicated. But there's been a second axis here um, and that marks the transition from classical to quantum information processing, harnessing the quantum nature of a physical system in order to achieve improvements in very specialized uh, applications. For example, quantum computation, which is the most famous ones, uh, but also quantum sensing and quantum communication. Here are some uh, examples of architectures, most, uh, most strikingly uh, superconducting qubits and then these centers. In this map, uh, we start here on the atomic scale, uh, controlling single atoms and molecules. And I will try to show you that we try to actually move to the right in this picture by combining what we're already good at, that is atomic scale imaging and atom manipulation, with um, what other architectures, the quantum architectures are already good at. For example, magnetic quantum sensing, where NV centers uh, are very promising, um, and also um, quantum coherent manipulation of atomic 
spins. And these are two works that I like very much. First, the one from uh, the Wachtrup group in here around the corner in, in Stuttgart, uh, who invented or pioneered this LV center magnetometry. And the second one is from uh, Andrea Morello in Australia, where they uh, had single phosphorus donors in uh, silicon, and they could show that they uh, do, can do this very beautiful Rabi oscillation measurements on indiv individual nuclear spins. And uh, the idea is now to, to, to combine that. And the method that we um, use to combine that is what I want to introduce to you in the first part. And then I want to show you some of the applications that Jose already outlined. The first one is atomic scale magnetic sensing. Uh, the third one is addressing single molecule, uh, a single atom nuclear spins with this technique. Um, and last but not least, uh, we want to shift gears from atoms to molecules. And um, let's start and jump in with the technique uh, single um, atom or sing, um, uh, electron spin resonance in a scanning tunneling microscope. This picture you see here, this is our workbench. This is a single iron atom that we deposited on uh, a thin layer of magnesium oxide atop a silver uh, 001 crystal. The role of the magnesium oxide here is to decouple uh, the iron atom from any interaction with the underlying silver substrate, which could lead to a condo effect or just some fringe of the uh, magnetic moment. So we want to have the magnetic moments as pristine as possible. And um, we're not going to look at iron atoms only in this talk. These are the real protagonists of today's talks. We have iron, but we have also homium and dysprosium, uh, titanium, and iron MCs. And just as different Pokemons, they all have different properties. For example, iron and homium, uh, dysprosium, they have uh, their large spin systems. So they have an anisotropy. Uh, uh, and like to only plane, uh, point out, out of the plane, um, even if we apply, uh, apply an infant magnetic field. In contrast, titanium and iron PC are in somewhat approximation uh, spin one half systems um, and, um, and follow, for example, an external magnetic field. Um, I briefly looked at the chat and my ah now my mouse is uh, working. Okay. Yeah. So Philip, sorry for interrupting. There's one question in the chat, uh, which is yes. uh, uh, apart from magnesium oxide, what other substrate works? So far none. And this is a very interesting question for the community, and we still have to solve that. But um, I think one of the reasons. So some some people have tried, but most people just just were busy with, with doing the exciting science that I partially going to present today. So uh, this is something that we need to work on. So far, it's only magnesium oxide. But in principle, there should be other substrate that are working. For example, sodium chloride could be a good candidate. Um, if you have strong interactions with the underlying substrate, uh, you get shorter coherence times as a general uh, rule of thumb. OK, um, you can ask any time, but as you, as you wish, you can also save it for the end. Um, both fine. So the idea now is to combine scanning tunneling microscopy with another great technique. And that is, of course, electron spin resonance. And as in conventional ensemble electron spin resonance, we need three ingredients. The first one is we need to somehow initialize our spin state. And um, we do that simply by applying to our tunnel junction a macroscopic, a big uh, magnetic field um, that is in, able to Zeeman split the two lowest lying spin states of, for example, our iron atom. And we adjust this magnetic field so that the uh, frequency splitting between the two lowest lying spin states is in the order of uh, 20 gigahertz, uh, roughly 100 microelectron volts. And at low temperatures, for us, this is roughly one Kelvin. Uh, this already leads to a higher population in the ground state than in the excited state, um, roughly 70, 30%. So this is the first one. And then we need a readout. For that, we employ uh, actually um, magnetic STM tips that we prepare by picking up magnetic atoms from the surface. So here's an old exp uh, example from Sebastian Lohr that he stated at IBM for Magnini's atoms on copper nitride. So what you do is you just approach your tip to something, some magnetic atom on the surface, and then you scan again, and maybe it's not there anymore. Why is it not there? Because it's on the tip. And we have some reason to, to show that. And one of the effects that we're actually looking for, which is that we see tunnel contributions, which are uh, magnetoresistive. So we will get a larger current when the spin is in a certain, of the, on the surface is in a certain state than if it's in the other state. And this helps us now to distinguish 
what state our spin on the surface is actually in. But uh, the last ingredient that we need uh, to make is that we need to somehow drive now our spin system into resonance. And for that, we add a radio frequency voltage to the tunnel junction. And um, this um, allows now to drive coherence transitions off from the ground state to the excited state and vice versa by employing or by adding an electric field um, in the junction if and only if we are at the resonance frequency of this transition. Then due to the resonance process, which is a story on its own, can, we can take half a, uh, talk half an hour about that. I'm just gonna cut it short today. Um, due to this resonance process, uh, we will get a change in the excited state population. Um, and that we can then detect, of course, by our magnetoresistive readout that we have. And this is then how this looks in a real STM measurement, where we, where we see a change in the tunnel current once we hit the resonance frequency. And this gives us the ESR spectrum. And as dictated by this textbook ESR equation that you see here, what we can now simply do is we can sweep the magnetic field, the external magnetic field, increase it, and we see a linear uh, change in the resonance frequency as given by this equation. And the beauty, what Jose already outlined in the introduction, is that the uh, energy resolution is now not uh, limited by thermal um, noise or thermal broadening, but only by the line width of these ESR peaks. And they are usually on the order of a couple or tens of megahertz. And that can go down to tens of nano electron volt. And all of the data that I'm going to show you greatly benefits from this fact that we have this huge energy resolution now. And this brings us to the first application part of this technique, uh, atomic scale magnetic sensing. Because this resonance frequency is not only determined by the macroscopic magnetic field, but also by any local magnetic field that we have in the surrounding of our atom on the surface. And the, the easiest example of that is if we simply have um, a couple of atoms close to each other, for example, these two iron atoms that we here have on the surface. Then if we measure on one of these atoms, let's call it the iron sensor atom, its resonance frequency will be influenced depending on whether the other atom that is next to it is in its ground state or in its excited state. This will, by the, by, in the simplest case, the dipolar field, shift the resonance frequency down or up. And this is actually the, something that we see in the ESR spectra. We see two peaks, one corresponding to the other atom being in its ground state, and another one corresponding to the other atom being in its excited state. And the excited state is smaller because on average, the iron atom spends less time in its excited state as it's expected thanks to Ludwig Boltzmann. And the other thing that is to, no, to note here is it's not only the height, it's also the splitting between these two peaks because that corresponds now how strong this magnetic field is that the other atom is acting. And this is something that we can test in the, in the, in the um, STM itself because we can now build or select pairs of iron atoms and measure them uh, as a function of distance. And this is now shown here. We see the frequency splitting of these two peaks as a function of distance between them. And as you can nicely see, it gives a very, very straight line in a logarithmic plot. And if you uh, fit that, it is very close to a one over R to the cube dependence. And one over R to the cube, if you think back to the beginning of physics, this is very characteristic for magnetic dipole interaction. And, um, this is what, 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 what is happening here. We basically have the same interaction between our two atoms uh, as between any uh, refrigerator magnet uh, that you have in front of your refrigerator. And more crucially now is you see here two lines. One is corresponding to, or this is always measured on an iron atom, but one has another iron atom close to it. And the other one has a different atom next, next to it, namely a cobalt atom. And the lines are not exactly the same, they are shifted. And this shift corresponds to basically the different moment of the other atom nearby. Meaning you can now use this measurements to determine what is the magnetic moment of another thing, of another atom, another molecule, another whatever uh, that is nearby. 
And this is making it a very powerful sensing technique. You see also that we have here some, some area that is suspiciously blank. And this is where we see some deviations, which are uh, still very, very interesting because this is actually closer than a nanometer. And then at a nanometer, you would expect something like Heisenberg exchange interaction. So the wave functions of our two atoms uh, overlap and uh, you have, get this beautiful interaction composed of uh, Pauli uh, exclusion principle and Coulomb interaction that uh, uh, make a magnetic effect. So this is now what we can use as quantum sensor. But now thinking back to my first slide, we can now add this and uh, uh, things that we are good at, which is, for example, atomic scale um, uh, manipulation. And this is what we've done here. We played with that. We built a dice out of five iron atoms. And if you are, if you think, put yourself into the position of the central iron atom, what it will feel is all the different fields of the other iron atoms, but they are all equal because they have the same distance because it's a dice. And this is actually then the ESR spectrum measured on the central iron atom. It doesn't look so simple. It has now one, two, three peaks, but these are actually easy to understand because this corresponds to none of the other iron atoms being in the excited state. This one, this higher one corresponds to, or also high one, corresponds to one of the other iron atoms being in the excited state, but we don't care which one, it's all degenerate. Uh, for that reason, we have also uh, this case where, three, where two of them are in the excited state. Um, it's even more degenerate, but also more likely. And even this case is not seen anymore because it's measured at very low temperatures. So we don't see that because it's not likely anymore, but we can, uh, crank out Ludwig Boltzmann and make this more likely by just just increasing the temperature, and this is this is what you see here. So so now you have actually more and more weight on the excited sp uh, spin um, states and see more of these higher uh, cases here. This makes it, for example, also very nice thermal sensor, a local thermal sensor, and of course we can completely destroy that by moving the central atom uh, out of the center, and then it gets uh, the de degeneracy is broken. So this shows you what, 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 what we can do on the atomic scale with that. But there's one more degree of freedom hidden here that I didn't talk about. And this is actually the time axis. So the fact that we, in a measurement that roughly takes a minute, see two peaks must mean that the other iron atom is flipping much faster than the time that we, that we have to take a measurement and also the time uh, that our amplifier is working at. And that's usually, you know, that on, this, on the millisecond scale. So our iron atom must be flipping faster than that. Otherwise we would see some, some back and forth between that or even only one peak. And I'm emphasizing that because um, maybe I'm covering the question in the chat in the next couple of slides. I'm also, um, covering that uh, or mentioning that because we found one example um, where this was not the case, where we actually just saw one peak and still found magnetism. And this is the story of holmium. So um, this is again measured on an iron sensor atom with the holmium nearby. And at first we really just saw one peak and we thought, is it even magnetic at all? Because if you see one peak, you can't tell whether it's magnetic or not. But we found out eventually that we could move our tip over the holmium atom apply some high energy electrons um, that would eventually um, switch the homium state. And we could witness this or prove that by then seeing the resonance at a different position that has now switched the homium atom. We could prove that by making now again distance dependent measurements and also making this back and forth, back and forth. So this is very great because it's, well, we, we sold this as a bit uh, at the time, but it's also a, and it was very long lived. So if you didn't touch it, it didn't switch. And we could at least monitor it for 10 hours, um, maybe, but probably it's longer than, uh, st stable longer than that. Um, but we could also use it as local uh, magnets for our measurements. And this is something that we even uh, developed further with the prosium atoms, which at least we could, which were even more stable, but we could also more precisely uh, position them on the surface. So you always see here an iron atom in the center and then surrounded by an increasing number of dysprosium atoms around them. And um, um, the beauty of this experiment is um, that um, um, you can now switch them basically one at a time 
And by doing that, you can adjust locally the magnetic field um, around the iron atom between plus to minus 25 millitesla. Of course, not continuously, and you have some debris, some, some, uh, some, some uh, uh, um, variation here, but it's still something that we hope we can use as a local magnet. And uh, with that, um, let me switch a little bit gears. Um, I think I'm going to uh, answer the, uh, the questions at the beginning because it takes me some time to read through them. I hope that this is okay. Uh, sorry about, uh, for that. I, I get back to all of that. Um, um, so we have talked about basically atoms on the surface that we can interact with. Um, but there's one more magnet very close by that we haven't talked about that, but that also affects greatly the spin resonance. And that is actually our magnetic tip. So I told you that for the readout, we pick up atoms from the surface, um, making the tip magnetic. Um, but this is also acting like a local magnet um, that we can include in our um, um, ESR equation if, uh, as an effective tip magnetic field. Let me show you what, uh, what that means. So what this means is that, we, that it creates a magnetic field by itself. And now this brought us to the idea to change the type of measurement that we're doing. Instead of having a constant tip position over the atom and sweeping the frequency of our measurement and detecting a resonance, we thought, hey, let's keep the frequency constant and actually move the tip across the surface. And then what we get is we get for a constant frequency, certain positions where the tip adds the right magnetic field um, to fulfill this resonance condition of the ESR equation. And this is here shown for a single titanium atom where we have a resonance pattern surrounding the uh, titanium atom where um, the tip magnetic field brings the system into resonance locally at certain X and Y positions. And if we can do this in X and Y, there's no reason that we shouldn't not be able to do that also in that. So this is the same titanium atom uh, measured at different tip heights uh, over the atom. And uh, we can basically shift this resonance pattern uh, around. And this resonance pattern now represents the magnetic interaction potential between two spins, one on the tip and one on the surface and how strong they basically couple. This is what we um, uh, image with this uh, resonance technique. And what, what, what I want to emphasize is this is not too much different than this, an, an MRI, a magnetic resonance image. But instead of imaging billions and billions of hydrogen nuclear spins in, in, in our body, this is now imaging just the interaction, the magnetic coupling between two spins, one on the tip and one on the sample. And another, well, something that I should mention is this is nothing new. This has been done uh, in, uh, for scanning nitrogen vacancy centers for, for 10 years or 15 years already. So here are two works from Harvard and Stuttgart. Uh, Stuttgart pioneered it. And here you see basically a ring that they see around an MV center when they scan with a magnetic tip uh, around it. And the tip, magnetic tip brings the MV center into resonance. So very, very similar what we do here. And actually they didn't invent, invent it. Uh, magnetic resonance force microscopy actually invented this in the 90s already. So they also copied it, which doesn't mean that MV centers aren't great. They are very excellent. They work at room temperatures, very high energy resolution. Um, um, but one thing where I think we are better is, is this. So these images are taken on a scale of 300 nanometers or so, or a couple of hundred nanometers. And I think this is something where we are better because we can really go down to the atomic scale and um, also employ uh, um, um, atomic um, um, manipula atom manipulation, as I will show in a second. First, there is uh, one very important peculiarity that we see that uh, other techies, I think, don't see. If you only have two spins, both spins become very, very important. Um, so what, we, what you see here is basically the evaluated potential, the magnetic uh, interaction potential uh, be, that we got from the uh, uh, figures that I showed two slides ago. And you see this looks a lot like a magnetic dipole. Here's also a simulation of a magnetic dipole, meaning the tip spin and the titanium spin on the surface couple with a magnetic dipole interaction in a certain way. But 
here is the same titanium atom um, imaged with another tip. So we basically just picked up uh, some other uh, atoms from the surface and saw this. And as everyone who's doing STM or even AFM in the audience knows, not every tip is different. Quite the contrast, every tip is, uh, in, is something else. And this is something that we see that now also in the magnetic inter interaction. Um, this looks very much more symmetrical and it fits very nicely to an exchange, a, a, a symmetric um, uh, exchange interaction potential. So the same two mechanisms that we saw for atoms on the surface, we also see for one atom on the tip and one atom on the surface. And it depends crucially on the tip state, uh, which one you see. But this not only holds for the tip, it also holds for atoms on the surface. And here in this, we basically have the same tip. So we have one image of three different types of atoms on the surface. Um, one titanium atom on an oxygen binding site, uh, titanium on a bridge binding site. So they have two binding sites that they can sit on and an iron atom. And now we scan and do the MRI for um, three different kinds of atoms on the surface. Um, and they all show different resonance patterns. So the titanium on bridge site was very quick, the iron relatively long, and now you see the titanium on an oxygen binding site here. And we can all model them, that's no problem. But the, the bottom line is if you make an MRI of only two spins, one on the tip and one on the surface, um, both spins matter because they have maybe different alignments, uh, different uh, spin moment, different distance between each other. And this all falls, um, and this is all what we can see and detect in this highly uh, resolved MRI images. This is one aspect. Another more practical aspect of this tip magnetic field that I want to highlight is we can actually use that as a replacement for an external magnetic field. So at some point we came up with the idea, hmm, can we not completely switch off the external magnetic field and only use the tip magnetic field to drive our resonance. And I wouldn't ask this question if the answer wouldn't be yes, of course you can. So what you see here is uh, an ESR signal on a single iron atom. And what we do here is we bring in the tip closer to the atom on the surface. And this basically is a tip field sweep in uh, Z direction. So we increase the, 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 the tip uh, or decrease the tip atom distance. And this basically makes uh, a magnetic field sweep, and we see um, a resonance here in the middle. And to show that this is a real resonance, what you can do is you can uh, set still the, the uh, resonance frequency that you probe at at different values, and you still see a linear shift in that. This usually doesn't have such a high energy resolution, but um, it still allows you to do spin resonance in completely zero magnetic field, which sometimes is important. For example, let me go to this. Uh, back to the slide um, and um, um, about the dysprosium atoms, we could show that they are stable in completely zero magnetic field or what we think is zero magnetic field and did these measurements and these evaluations with tip field measurements only. And this was driven by APA who um, um, uh, came up with the idea to look at these dysprosium atoms in the first place. And with that, um, let's, let's go back to atoms on the surface. And these are atoms now, titanium atoms, that, that don't have any um, other atom close by. So here's maybe something, but here's a defect on the surface, but um, there's no other atom nearby. And still, for the lower two atoms, we actually see a lot of peaks, six and eight. And um, the solution to this riddle is actually found if you look at the isotopic table of um, titanium. And then you see there's two species, titanium-49 uh, and titanium-47, that actually carry a nuclear spin um, of five-half and seven-half. There are a lot of uh, species that don't have a, a nuclear spin, titanium-48 or titanium-46 and titanium-50, but some of them have. And um, then you can expect an additional interaction um, by the so-called hyperfine interaction, the in the action between an electron spin and its own nuclear spin. You can think of that basically they're both the spins, so they should couple at least by the magnetic dipolar interaction, mm -hmm. but also by uh, something called Fermi contact interaction. Um, more crucially is um, this allows us now for the first time for single spins on the surface to detect nuclear spins, which brings me to the next section. 
technically, this is nothing new. So technically speaking, people were able to do this uh, since well, well before most of us are born. So this is very nice work from McGarvey from the 1960s. So this is was before the Berlin Wall, um, and they measured already at the time electron spin resonance in titanium uh, in, this, in, in this compound. And they also see uh, eight peaks here, six peaks, and then two peaks are buried in here, and this very dominant uh, titanium 48 and other uh, zero uh, spin zero um, isotopes in here. But of course, the, the, the good thing that we can do is now do this atom by atom. And then we can combine it again with atomic scale control. And this is one example that I want to give you in the, the next example. I already outlined a little bit that titanium can sit on two binding sites. One of that um, is on what we call the bridge binding site. So this is a titanium 47 atom, has again six peaks here. And if we um, um, align our microscope well, then we can determine, okay, this is on a bridge binding site, meaning it's between two oxygen atoms. So the intersects of the light line in this lower figure um, are um, uh, oxygen atoms in the underlying magnesium oxide uh, layer. So that's between two oxygens. And what we can do now, we can take our tip and, and push this atom half a lattice site to the left on top of one of those oxygen atoms. So the oxygen binding site. And um, amazingly, this completely changes the hyperfine uh, spectrum. It gets much more narrower. But we can also push it further back to a bridge binding site and see this uh, splitting again. And um, to, be, to be honest, when we first did these measurements, I did not understand this. Because when I was an undergrad, I learned something from my professor. Usually, you don't do this in undergrad, so don't get, don't get uh, uh, embarrassed. But uh, I got taught. Uh, during my undergrad, that the hyperfine coupling is, is, is very, very stable. So stable that we actually use it to define our unit of time. It's uh, this number of cycles um, between the hyperfine levels of uh, cesium-133. And there's another example where it's used because it's so stable. This is a famous 21 centimeter line for, for hydrogen, um, which uh, is used in radio astronomy to determine sources of hydrogen in the universe. And the third example is again hydrogen here. I excuse the, uh, the, the, the full frontal nudity here, but this is the pioneer's plague that we sent out uh, into the solar system, um, which, which is uh, uh, basically telling foreign life terms um, um, who we are, where we are. And um, the unit in this, this plague is here in the corner. And this is actually the, this, this um, 21 centimeter line. So the hyperfine splitting uh, between uh, the two ground state or the ground state and the excited state uh, of the hydrogen uh, with its own nuclear spin. And this is used as both an axis of time uh, and uh, uh, length in this plot. So it's a very, very precise measure of everything if it is in a free atom. But we don't have free atoms here. We actually always have our atom in a compound. So it changes the electronic environment, the ground state, the chemical binding, um, and this changes the electron spin, and this is reflected in the coupling with its own nuclear spin. And this is again a study from the 1960s after the Berlin Ball. But uh, what they gathered in this review is basically um, um, the hyperfine coupling for titanium and copper, many, many different compounds. And here it's always different. And the reason that it's always different is because you have a different electronic structure around it, uh, making it a great magnetic sensor or sensor to determine what is the electronic properties of your spin in the surroundings. And this is what, what is actually happening here, right? So, so we change the binding configuration of our atom on the surface by, by pushing it to a different binding site. And this is um, 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 also found by, by, by basically Jose, uh, and Alejandro, who simulated this with DFT uh, and showed basically uh, that, the, that the ground state orbital looks different on these different binding sites. And basically, this, this is then showing that you have a different electron cloud um, around your nuclear spin that then can couple differently to your nuclear spins. And we went very much down into detail, which I don't want to do in this overview talk, uh, but you can extract a lot of information about your uh, uh, um, um, electronic, chemical, and magnetic properties of your atom uh, from uh, these measurements. 
What I want to do instead is briefly convince you that this is not only uh, that, that this this uh, green hump is not only garbage, but that it's actually um, that there's more structure in that. And for that, we had to really, really zoom in and average hard for 10 hours. Um, and then we saw this. So this is at the limit of our uh, noise resolution. And um, you, you see that there are peaks. They're a bit noisy. But something one thing is very, very clear. The peaks are not equally spaced anymore. And this is because we have to add one more ingredient that becomes or this that is equally large uh, on this scale as our hyperfine splitting. And this is um, the so-called magnetic uh, uh, nuclear magnetic uh, nuclear electric quadrupole interaction. What does that mean? So for titanium, independent of on our surface or off our surface, has not a spherical nucleus. It has um, a quadrupole moment in the nucleus and the and, and a uh, a quadrupole moment can couple to an electric field gradient. A charge can couple to an electric field, and quadrupole moment can couple to an electric field gradient. And if you do the math, a, 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 um, a d orbital has such an electric field gradient. So what you expect is another contribution from this so-called nuclear electric quadrupole interaction, which looks a little bit like zero field interaction, but for the nuclear spin. And Basically, what happens here is um, we have this Hamiltonian. We have to add this contribution. And because they are roughly um, equal in size, this messes up our energy levels uh, because um, this, uh, the, the Hamiltonian gets very much stirred up. But we can use the same fitting parameters for the two isotopes, which made us very confident that this is actually the physics happening here. And with that, um, still have some time. Huh? Uh, I uh, want to switch gears again and talk briefly about something new uh, about molecules. And actually, if I, very, if, I, if I made a very, very bad sales pitch, uh, I would say nothing changes. So everything that we could do for atoms, we can also now do for molecules. Uh, the molecules that we started, looked at, the f uh, at first are the, the fruit flies of uh, STM research. So phthalocyanide molecules, in this case, iron phthalocyanines that be deposited together with iron atoms on our surface. Um, um, but if I made a better sales pitch, I would say it's, it's, we can do the same things. So we can do all the nice things um, that I showed you before, we can now do with molecules. And I want to show you a few. First of all, we can do spin resonance. Here are resonance peaks taking a different magnetic field, change in tunnel current, um, and the frequencies we appear on the axis. We see this linear increase. Um, this is now, now all taken in, in Korea. Um, so we have uh, even an out of plane magnetic field, a vector magnet. And uh, one thing that was very nice about these molecules is that they are, uh, to a very good approximation, a spin one half system, the best spin one half system that we probably uh, have. There's a little bit of anisotropy uh, due to uh, some remaining uh, spin orbit interaction. But uh, to a good degree, it's behaving like, like, like an electron. And then there is, as most of you know, this. This, this great property of molecules that they uh, arrange themselves on the surface uh, in an ordered structure as demonstrated here by the Korean boy band Tleasure in a square lattice. It turns out the iron phthalocyanine molecules do exactly the same on the surface. They form a an, 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 an dense ensemble here of a quartet. And uh, this is again, nothing really new. I, let me show here one, uh, 10 year old work from Mahi Tavares group in Japan that I find very beautiful. And this, of course, opens up now the way to, to, to uh, make ordered lattices of molecules and, and um, couple them with spin resonance. Um, we looked at the building blocks of that. The building block of that is just two of these molecules um, at a time. If we do that and just look for dimers on the surface, we find that we actually have two kinds of dimers that are related by mirror symmetry. Uh, we call them the 5-0 and the 4-3. Why do we call them that? Well, these ones are separated with respect to the underlying MGO lattice by five uh, uh, unit cells of the MGO lattice. So they also sit on an oxygen binding site of the underlying MGO. Um, and uh, we have them to go five, di five unit uh, uh, cell or five lattice, lattice constants to the right roughly 1.5 nanometers to reach the other center. And there's another configuration which has a, a four or three uh, distance. Now you do the Pythagoras in your head. 
same distance. Um, um, and they are related by mirror symmetry. But actually what we found or, um, is that they are not so much the same. So um, here you see the ESR spectra taken for these two configurations. And uh, we see in both cases, two peaks. Quick reminder, two, two peaks we had before. This is due to uh, some coupling. Um, and one is due to the excited state and one is due to the ground state. And the difference between them basically tells us uh, how strong the coupling is. Now we know the magnetic moment of these parallel style sign, one we bore, and uh, you can, then, you can, then you can calculate what, what should be the splitting, and it should be around 90 megahertz. In both cases, we measure something that is larger than that. That is already a smoking gun that we are having some contribution from the exchange interaction here. And of course, more strikingly, what we see is, in this case, it's actually larger. It's uh, by a factor of two larger than in this configuration. And of course, then the, 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 the smoking gun is, can it have to do anything with the, with the different binding configurations and maybe with, the, the, with what the molecules have that the atoms don't have, namely ligands. So we ask uh, our uh, theorist of, of, of choice, but it's also Jose, but in this case it was uh, Chris Wolf. And uh, he calculated this now on these two binding configurations and said, well, on this configuration, uh, they ever so slightly, due to the MGO lattice, like to get closer, uh, meaning the distance between the, the closest distance between, between two benzene uh, rings um, is slightly smaller. And then he calculated, calculated the, the exchange interaction. Um, and this looks looked like that, these, these uh, dots on, on here. And this very much nicely fitted, uh, except for an offset, um, um, our experimental observation. So um, ever so slightly, uh, we have, so we have, first of all, um, um, a coupling that is not simply two molecules tension next to each other, um, but we have a coupling that is somewhat mediated via the spin distribution that extends a little bit over the ligand. And then they touch each other ever so slightly, forming some exchange interaction, super exchange, if you like. Um, and, and this is something that we didn't have for single atoms. And it's also something uh, that we hopefully can tune by right? just swapping the ligand structure and uh, tuning in that way the coupling between spins on our surface. This is one thing that we did for molecules. Another thing that we did for um, um, uh, molecule, uh, mo uh, molecules, we, we already did this for titanium atoms. Kai talked about this last time already, um, but uh, we also were able to do first coherent measurements of the spin state uh, of the uh, iron PC molecules. And um, the way that you do is you, everything that I've shown today, we are so-called CW measurements, continuous wave ESR measurements. So we have a long radio wave just, just flying in and you can uh, uh, tune that to pulses, to pulses of a certain length. And if you do that, you basically rotate your spin for a certain time on the so-called block sphere. And uh, the longer you uh, rotate, um, um, the, the more you uh, tune your spin from the ground to the excited state and basically up and down between that. And this is uh, referred to often as Rabi oscillation measurements uh, if you increase the pulse width. Another thing that you can do is you can rotate more stronger or weaker. Uh, this is usually adjusted by the RF voltage amplitude. So if we tune that one, um, we can actually rotate it faster or slower. Um, but you also see another fact here, and this is these oscillations, they, they, they decay, they get lost. And this is done on a scale of roughly 100 nanoseconds. So depending on who asked, this is rather fast for, for if, you, if, if this would be a qubit. Um, and the reason for that is, well, first of all, this is, this is decoherence. This is uh, your cat coming from uh, dead and alive to dead or alive. Uh, and one of the reasons is the tunnel current. So we constantly um, um, shooting electrons at our spin center. So we have to get uh, better in doing that to extend our uh, coherence time of our spins on the surface. Another thing, we have also thermal um, decoherence sources. Um, and uh, this would be one way how to fight decoherence uh, to go to lower temperatures. So I said today that uh, everything was measured here at 500 millikelvin or one Kelvin. So something that we try to do here in Karlsruhe now is I teamed up with Wolfgang Bernsdorfer, who is an expert on building his own dilution refrigerators. And uh, we are in the process of setting up 
uh, two systems, one uh, for the home built system, Grimhilde, and one uh, uh, called Hildegard. And some of you recognize the Unisoku uh, STM table, the U U USM 1500. And you ask yourself, where is the cryostat? But right? this is our cryostat. So it's really, really tiny. And the STM is here at, at the bottom. So um, these dilution refrigerators are, are very small, very compact. Um, and uh, um, we are uh, currently in the process of uh, uh, stitching this together and hopefully we can cool down in the next couple of weeks. So I should be dragged away from the lab today, uh, which of course was was heavy occasion, but still um, the, our first system is still um, uh, operational. Uh, we still have to fight with some noise. So this is a silver surface uh, at 50 millikelvin. Here's a closed shot uh, of the different temperature stages. So we had a way uh, of improving that right now. One thing that helps us in improving and uh, uh, getting rid of our uh, errors is that the cool down time of the cryostats is super fast. Uh, so we cool down from room temperature to 50 millikelvin in only six hours. Mm -hmm. So we can do also quick iterations of uh, improvement uh, fast. And I have been blessed with a very excellent team here. First of all, Wolfgang Bernstorfer, who's a mastermind behind the Sion D type uh, cryostats. There's also a startup in, uh, Sell, starting to sell these now. Christoph Sörgers, who's an expert in well, everything, uh, and an excellent team, Daria, Mate, Van Tong, Paul. Uh, and of course, you. So we want you to move atoms. So if you're interested, in just, just contact me uh, if you like what you saw. But now more important, um, I've been also blessed to be able to work with all of these people who were involved in the beautiful data that I actually uh, showed today. And um, um, this was an excellent team effort. Of course, I have to highlight Andreas Heinrich, who's really the mastermind behind this ESR STM technique. Uh, Taeyong Che and Chris Lutz are the uh, leader at uh, uh, the Center for Quantum Nanoscience, where Andreas is also the director. And uh, the IBM lab, Yujang Be and Chris Wolf. Uh, Yujang was on most of the papers and uh, probably the next presenter here and <laughs> from, our, from our field. And Christoph uh, was our theory guy. Uh, Shui uh, did all the molecules um, and, and, and painstaking measured hundreds of them. Uh, so, and uh, Aparajita was involved in the, or was the leader of the dysprosium uh, effort. Kai, of course, already presented here. Fabian presented here. Uh, Susanne is now in Stuttgart and uh, we are also collaborating. And of course, she was there since the very beginning. Um, and of course, our excellent collaborators, I highlighted already Jose and Alejandro, Joaquin, of course, and Arjan Adelman, who is an expert on conventional ESR. I hope I did not forget any, anyone. Of course, we have funding. Again, it was all uh, mostly funded by uh, Korea with a great effort, and it's continuing there. So if you're interested, also contact Andreas. Um, and uh, with that, let me give you one take home message, uh, and let me die for that back to the beginning, to these two pictures that I showed you. And I hope I could convince you that this ESR STM technique is now a great tool in order to sense and control on the atomic scale. And I gave you different examples of how this is possible. Nuclear spins, uh, uh, degeneracy, uh, atom manipulation, uh, magnetic imaging, uh, and that we can also extend this to molecules. And with that, Thank you very much. Um, and I'm looking forward to discussions and to your questions. Thanks a lot, Philip, for this really awesome talk and for telling us about this uh, really outstanding experiment showing the potential of ESR to manipulate single atom. So now we have some time for questions. And if you have a question, you can either write it in the chat or raise your hand. And I would suggest that we can start with some questions that we have written in the chat. Um, so the first question is, if you can see magnetic frustration with ESR? Um, I would say potentially yes. Uh, Kai Yang showed last time a trimer um, that, that um, I think it goes into that direction. You, of course, have to be very, very um, careful on what you're building. So, um, um, for example, a tip field might break the symmetry because the atom under your... Uh, tip is getting a slightly higher magnetic field uh, than anything else. But in principle, yes, I, I would say. Yeah. Great, thanks. Uh, then the next question is, will the measurement influence the state of the target atom, for example, with the tip magnetic field? Oh, great. I answered this already partially. Yes. So, so you, you can, you can um, 
I mean, what, what it's in the end, so you can think it of, of, of it uh, as an additional magnetic field. You can also think of it as, as an exchange interaction between two spins. And the spin on the tip is, is that second exchange uh, coupled atom. Um, so it will, of, of course, influence it. Sander Otte did a very nice work on um, and, and, and uh, his, his, his lab in using the tip feed to perfectly align two spins on the surface. Uh, so you can also use it. Uh, but yeah, you, yeah, I, I hope um, I answered that a little bit. It, it's definitely influencing. Yeah, great. Thanks a lot. And then the next question is, while applying a bias pulse on the atom, did you observe any motion of the atom or did it stay fixed? Uh, that's the that's that's a good question. I think we did not uh, look into that. So maybe this is referring a little bit to the work that terahertz pulsed uh, STM is doing. Um, they I think see something like that. I think we are um, we are too slow to see something like that because any vibration of an atom on the surface um, uh, would be too fast for us. Great. Thanks a lot. Uh, and now, uh, Christian, I think that you are unmuted. Do you want to ask some question? Oh, no. So then uh, we have a question by Jasha. Jasha, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, thanks for this very nice overview. So on one of your slides, you had this temporal resolution of a millisecond. Yeah. I guess this is if you just take, um, if you record the current, let's say. Yeah. But for these nice spectra that you showed, how long does it typically take to one to take one spectrum? Um, let, let, let's say, um, so this is, of course, the publication data. So it's this averaged uh, um, couple of times. So these are maybe an hour or so, but mm, a decent, okay. let, let's, let's say a decent spectrum you can get in a couple of, of minutes. OK. And a very good one rather than an hour. Yes. So okay. the, the, yeah, the, the, the publication ready figures are one hour, but sometimes, okay. sometimes this is, this is, so you have to always look close. So you can make very nice spectra by zooming out and uh, just having a lot of tunnel current uh, uh, in the junction that broadens your peak. But if you just make a nice uh, enough range, uh, then it still looks, looks, looks good. Um, and you, the higher the tunnel current, the, the, the uh, better the, 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 the signal is. So we can get several pico amperes in measuring uh, me me measurement amplitude, but then your peaks get broader. So that's usually the downside. Thanks a lot. Right. So the next question uh, is in the chat, which is, did you measure resonance resonance frequencies more than 40 gigahertz, for example, 100 gigahertz? Um, I personally did not. And this is the great chance to uh, highlight some of uh, uh, our, our friends. So Christian asked is, uh, uh, I think the record holder in Stuttgart uh, who can measure between 60 and 90 gigahertz, which is very impressive. And he spent a lot of time optimizing the, the frequency uh, uh, for that. And uh, our friends in Zurich, um, 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 uh, um, Sebastian Stepanov and uh, Pietro Gambadella, they can measure up to 40 gigahertz. So between 30 and 40 gigahertz, this is for the usually uh, normally uh, measure. Yeah. Great, thanks a lot. Then the next question is, uh, would it be possible to prepare the spin state of the tunneling electrons in any superposition state? Um, I think yes. So, so, so I, I think uh, this, this uh, first um, Rabi oscillations uh, are, are not so much away. So something that I haven't shown today, Kai did this last time when, when he spoke, is you can, um, we can already do decent Hahn echo measurements where you uh, have basically to project into the plane, then propagate, then make a pi pulse back. So we are on the way to, um, to quantum information processing. Um, in my opinion, um, we can follow the path for, for example, like superconducting qubits or NV centers. But currently our biggest issue is the coherence times that we need to boost more and more to keep up with that. And um, that, that's why well, we, we try to cool down first. Uh, yeah, great, thanks a lot. And the next question is, can you measure ESR on condo systems or they are incompatible because of condo screening? That is such a good question. Um, um, I think so. 
I think so. So, so the, the, I didn't uh, uh, cover this last time, but yeah. So, so we also measured at some point copper. Copper showed a slight conduct dip, and you probably, uh, in whether you can sense a nearby uh, copper atom. I think there's a proposal from a uh, from a Korean theory group uh, how to measure a nearby condo system as well. Um, but would be super interesting. And it's not, it's, it's not without, uh, it's probably within reach. Great, thanks a lot. And there's now a question by Fabian. Fabian, please go ahead. Yes, I was just wondering, and I think most of your papers usually never talk about super exchange interaction. Is it something that one cannot measure with this technique or in the systems that you so far investigated, it's just negligible? Um, so depending, I, I, guess, I guess this is, um, so for the atoms, I think uh, uh, Jose is even the better uh, source for that. <laughs> but it, it depends. So, so for the atoms, you could argue, that are they directly coupling? Are they coupling via the MGO? Are they coupling via the silver substrate? Um, I actually don't know. I just measured it. Uh, for, the, for the molecules, I think it depends a little bit um, on your definition of super exchange. Probably it's super exchange. So it, I, I, my, my textbook example of, of uh, uh, super exchange is manganese oxide. So you have manganese, manganese, and oxygen uh, atom in the middle. And this is the super exchange that, that, that is happening. Here we have molecule, molecule, ligand, ligand. So it's, it's, it's for me very, very similar. So I would probably call it even super exchange. Great. So the next question, uh, it's in the chat, and it's, do you always need the coupling of magnetic atom from the substrate? Like having an MGO layer, uh, does it limit the system that this technique can be used for? Yeah, this is a very good question. Um, let me give you the, not the half an hour, but the uh, uh, five, five sentences answer. Um, so probably not. It helps to increase the lifetime um, of, of the spin system on the surface. Um, and um, so if you would put it directly on the metal, it might give worse energy resolution because your lifetimes are even shorter than this 100 nanoseconds or so. Um, now, uh, the, there's another ingredient, which is um, this resonance mechanism that we think is happening requires the atom to sh shake a little bit uh, in order to drive transitions. So this must, would still be required. We think that the MGO is somewhat involved in that process. So it's actually very crucial that someone shows it that it's working on something else than uh, MGO. So um, um, yeah, this is on our to-do list. And I think I answered it in the beginning. Um, uh, we should do that. And everyone just in the field got distracted by these other measurements that are, are also exciting. But this is something that we need to do, I guess, soon. Great, thanks a lot. And there's one question by Dong Fei. Dong Fei, please go ahead. Uh, hello. Uh, thanks, thanks, Philip. Thanks a lot. It's a great talk. Uh, I have two technical uh, questions. The first is for the homium, you want to switch it from a down state to an up state by a spin polarized current, right? For that, uh, you need the tip also spin polarized up, right? Um. Yes and no. So, so we, so the idea is we, we never, we never have a fully spin polarized um, um, tip. Um, it's, it's, it has a majority uh, spin direction, but not, um, it's not one hundred percent spin polarized. So, what we do is we more or less switch it randomly. So, we, we, we go to high voltages. Um, uh, have then, for example, the ESR mechanism to sense in what state it is, is in, but we cannot reliably uh, tell that it switched in uh, this, this, uh, this state um, 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 with the full control. We still have a direct readout on the homian atom that I didn't talk about, uh, but we still need to wait for some time until it switches. We cannot control it uh, uh, with that precision that you just, just, just mentioned. So we, we basically might have to do this one or two times. Uh, okay, or, okay. So or wait for a certain time. Uh, yes. So the next question is uh, for this uh, marrying about the coherence time between two spins. 
like uh, sometimes you apply some uh, five or two pounds, uh, but those things like uh, how to exactly, how to technically apply those uh, five or two pounds or five pounds. That's a spin. good, yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent question. So basically um, what, what we follow is this, the standard uh, uh, gauge technique that any quantum architecture uses. Huh? So this is basically step one, you make a uh, Rabi oscillation measurements, then the Rabi oscillation tells you, okay, um, I need this much time when I apply this power uh, to flip the spin from this state to here. And this gives you the, the pi over two time that you need to have the piles on. And with that, you could then go, go one step further and do a Hahn echo or a Ramsey fringe experiment that Ramsey gives you then even preciser the resonance frequency. And this is how you would gauge your qubit, though we are not at the state yet where this is really a qubit. Okay, perfect. Thanks, thanks a lot. Great. So uh, I would say that now would be a good time to uh, stop the official part of the colloquium. So first of all, thank you so much, Philip, for this really outstanding talk and for telling us about this really breakthrough findings with ESR STM.